I believe that all good pieces of architecture, all great pieces of architecture tell a good story. But I also believe that we need to tell a new story about the way we build our houses and our communities. Some people have estimated that if you consider all aspects of construction and operations, then buildings account for some 48% of our world's total greenhouse gas emissions, which is almost half. Now, the essence of this new story is that our buildings can actually save the planet, but only if we radically rethink the very nature of design itself and move beyond sustainability towards a new form of architecture that regenerates not just the environment, but all aspects of our lives. Now, of course, I've entitled this new kind of thing I'm talking about, How Green Was My Valley. And what I'm trying to do here is assemble an alternate history, or more precisely, a memory of the future for the Okanagan. The idea is that using what we know right now, we should be able to imagine or describe what the Okanagan Valley could be like in the year 2020 if we did everything right. Now, looking back from nine years in the future, we can see that like any good story, this one has its villains, or in this case, two villains that we ourselves have created. The first is the threat of global warming, and the second one is, of course, quite much closer to home, and that's the devastation that's been wrought by the mountain pine beetle, which threatens not only our forests, but our safety as well in terms of forest fires. In this alternative future, the key event in dealing with these threats occurred in September of 2011, when the government of British Columbia donated to Okanagan College a 12,000 hectare research forest infested with pine beetles. Now, while some would claim that this wasn't much of a gift, the province had made a similar contribution to the College of New Caledonia in 2008, and that forest now generates some $300,000 annually for the college's research activities. The college immediately recognized that this was a resource that could be used to solve multiple problems. It could be used to mitigate the pine beetle problem, make housing more affordable, enhance the Canadian economy, and produce a parcel solution to global warming. I was going to add it would cure the common cold, but I thought that might be going too far. But I do want to explain to you in detail how the college did this. This image represents a stand of 145 lodgepole pines, which is, of course, the species most affected by the pine beetle. If these trees are allowed to rot in the forest, they're going to release more than 100 tons of uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And not only that, of course, pose a severe fire threat. But if they're harvested, that carbon is sequestered and can be even sold as a carbon offset under proposed cap and trade systems. The other thing about these lodgepole pines is that they contain 56 cubic meters of usable timber, which is enough to make a 1,500 square foot house using a unique form of construction, which I'm going to describe in just a minute. Now, realizing the urgency of the situation, the college began harvesting the affected trees immediately. It bundled them into lots of 145 and offered them for sale. These bundles were marketed as an inexpensive means of acquiring the main materials for a starter house. And once offered for sale, these bundles were snapped up by parents and grandparents wanting to give their progeny a leg up in the housing market. All of this wood, however, could not be used immediately, and so many of the bundles were sunk into our lakes where they could be stored indefinitely and increasing in value. In an environmentally safe manner that does no damage to the wood but prevents it from rotting and releasing its CO2 into the atmosphere. Now, the college profited from this endeavor in two ways. Not only did it sell the wood at, the profit, at a profit, but it was also able to sell the carbon sequestered in the wood as carbon offsets at $15 a ton, or approximately $1,600 per bundle. Now, the cost of harvesting 145 lodgepole pines, I've calculated, is about $2,400. And if you sell each bundle for $3,000, then the college would recognize a profit of $2,200 on each bundle sold. These revenues provided the college with ongoing and sustained matching funding for all its research projects. 
And this is the, the next part is important in this alternative history. Flush with cash and ready for research, the college hosted a national competition to design a 1,500 square foot house completely built from cross laminated timber and meeting the conditions of regenerative design. Now, as I'm sure Bill Downing is going to tell you later today, um, cross laminated timber is the future. Perhaps this isn't the future. There it is. It's the future of forestry and of construction. Uh, and in fact, you should probably should know this, that little more than a week ago, Structure Lamb opened uh, one of the first facilities in Canada for manufacturing this, this kind of uh, timber. And at their factory, strips of beetle kill lumber can be glued together, forming panels that are as big as 3 meters high and 12 meters long. And these are like the pieces of a child's building block set, and they can be used to form walls and floors and roofs and quickly assembled into buildings up to 11 story high. Not only that, these buildings are structurally sound, they're extremely fire resistant, and provide a high degree of insulation. The doors, the windows, the wiring, and the finishes are all installed in the factory, which greatly increases the quality control. At the same time, this slashes labor costs at the building site by significantly reducing the construction time. Eight stories of this building just outside of London were constructed in 27 days by just four people, which is a remarkable feat. Cross-laminated timber had already proven its worth in Europe, but Canada, with its vast forest reserves, was the country that benefited most from this new material. And to a great extent, it was cross-laminated timber that allowed Canada to play a leadership role in the emerging field of regenerative design. Now, Regenerative design is the next generation of green buildings, and they change the way we look at architecture. You can see here all of the wonderful things they do, like producing more energy than they consume, but there's two that I want to draw your attention to. Most important of all, they create income for their inhabitants, and they do so in an environment which is devoid of toxic chemicals. Now, looking back, it was realized that houses in 2011 were really just machines for spewing out crap. <laughs> they consumed huge amounts of materials and energies, and they squandered, they squandered enormous opportunities in terms of natural energy sources, and they really do produce nothing but waste of all kinds. All the while, homeowners get to pay hundreds of dollars every month for this privilege. Now, regenerative houses are a different animal. Now here the components work together to harvest and share energy, not just from natural sources, but from waste as well, and actually produce, energy, uh, produce electricity. And here, water is purified and reused right on the provinces. But this is only part of it. Energy efficiency is only part of the problem, and the college realized that they had not addressed the whole problem if they only made buildings that used less energy. The careful choice of materials, for example, can not only reduce the overall carbon footprint of a building, but make it safer at the same time. A regenerative house is made of materials that sequester carbon, such as wood, rather than those whose manufacture adds greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. In 2011, the production of concrete alone accounted for 7% of the world's total greenhouse gas emissions. And on the other hand, a regenerative house, you wrap it in green roofs and green walls, it was found to eliminate 100 kilograms of carbon monoxide annually. More serious was the fact that in 2011, we were in daily contact with toxic chemicals embedded in our building materials. In many ways, it's extraordinary that we allowed such a dangerous situation to persist for so long when there were alternatives. Not only did we eliminate toxic materials from our buildings, but we also learned to use natural and native vegetation to draw toxins from the surrounding soil and water. The real potential of regenerative design was found to be in creating environments that make us healthier. When we did all of those things, then regenerative houses began to generate income for their inhabitants, making housing more affordable. Moreover, Canada's finest architects rose to the challenge of Okanagan College's design competition by creating regenerative buildings or houses of great beauty and utility, which transformed the very notion of architecture. And because of advances in computer-controlled machinery, these designs were downloaded directly into the equipment at factories such as Structure Lamb, where the parts and pieces of a regenerative house could be manufactured quickly and efficiently. Now, here's an example. 
from a British firm, uh, what they did with a similar mandate. Um, this naked house contains, comes, comes in a container, and it contains all of the parts and pieces for the house, but also forms part of the, the uh, final building. And note that even the doors and windows were formed from the cross-laminated timber that was cut out to make those openings. Now, in this particular history of the future, the sales of the college's regenerative homes, which were developed from the design competition, began in 2013. As with all new products, sales began slowly. But then the first owners of these homes began to rave about both the health benefits of living in a regenerative house and the fact that they save $300 a month or more in utilities. Sales began to climb, and to keep up with demand, in 2016, Structure Lamb opened a second plant and began exports to other countries as well. These homes, however, were also living labs. Each was outfitted with a suite of inexpensive wireless sensors that transmitted key data, such as climate, lighting levels, and energy use, back to a central server. Providing Okanagan College with an invaluable research tool in the form of the most extensive green bait... Yeah. Let me see if I can get my tongue to catch up with me. The most extensive database of green building data on the planet. One of the sad things about green buildings is, and about buildings in general, is we really don't understand how they work. Um, now, generous to a fault, the college shared this data freely and openly with researchers from around the world. And it also gave the college the necessary data to model new ideas and techniques for construction and design using computer-based simulations. Now, responding to this opportunity, the college launched successive competitions to design regenerative multifamily dwellings, schools, hospitals, public buildings, office buildings, and factories. And in each case, the benefits of this approach to architecture had significant other benefits as well. For example, regenerative hospitals help patients recover sooner. Regenerative schools help students learn better. And again, these buildings were laced with sensors that contributed even more information to the central database. The key findings from this wealth of data had been suspected but anecdotal evidence as anecdotal evidence but never proven. For example, natural light was found to enhance almost every human activity from learning to healing. And letting people take control and take responsibility for their environment through operable windows and accessible thermostats proved the best means of assuring energy efficiency. It was not a smart grid, but rather empowering people to act smart that made a difference. The college showed that, in fact, we can make buildings that regenerate the environment at the same time as they improve our health and quality of life. Moreover, when the college branched out and investigated the life cycle costs of commercial buildings, it found that construction and operations were minuscule compared to the salaries of the people who worked in those buildings. While regenerative buildings can significantly reduce and even reverse the energy costs of any building, for commercial buildings, there's far greater savings to be derived. The college found that regenerative buildings increased productivity by as much as 10% and reduced absenteeism by 15%. Given that, ca that Canadian productivity often increases by only 1% or less in the course of a year, regenerative design quickly became part of Canada's economic strategy. There was one other lesson, however, that the college also learned. Many people accept the wisdom of the triple bottom line, that measures the, co the true cost of development in terms of ecology, economics, and social equity, or sometimes called planet profits and, and people. This alone, however, did not lead to the kind of change that the college envisioned. Yes, it is necessary to respect the environment and work with natural materials, methods, and energy sources to make regenerative buildings. And yes, it is necessary to acknowledge economics and to develop approaches which are both affordable and profitable. And yes, it is necessary to make our buildings equitable so that housing becomes more affordable and accessible to everyone. But it's also necessary to provide experiences which are so compelling that they're almost irresistible. The college quickly came to understand that regenerative buildings must be as desirable in the minds of consumers as iPods and Ferraris. This is what high-quality design provides, and it is the one component that's sadly missing in today's approaches to sustainability. We need our architects and engineers to exercise the fullest extent of their talents to create places where we really want to be. And the sweet spot? Well, when you do all of these things, where they intersect, this really is the future of architecture. Now, with all of these lessons learned, by 2020, the Okanagan Valley was recognized as the world leader in regenerative design. 
Its economy was booming due to the industries that had grown up around cross-laminated timber. Its architects, engineers, and technologists were in demand all over the world for their innovative approach to construction. Research was being commercialized at an unprecedented rate, and new programs in sustainable design at both the college and UBCO were drawing applicants from across the country and around the world. So to bring this scenario back to the present, and because all the information in this presentation is based on real data and technologies which are feasible today, we can assert that regenerative design is the most effective, the fastest, the most equitable, and the least expensive means of combating global warming, not to mention addressing the pine beetle problem. And in effect, our buildings can save the planet, but only if we recognize, as the American architect William McDonough has said, that being less bad is not good enough. So thank you very much. And I just wanted to mention that if you'd like to find out more about some of the resource-positive architecture, this was a project we did, people like Robert McDonald and I worked on, uh, please feel free to visit our website. Thanks again. Thank you. Oh, thank you.